Hello everyone, this is the third class of Digital Systems Design Lecture Series and in today's class we'll cover a technique called Carnot Maps that will optimize a combination of logic circuit based on a particular cost criterion. The cost could be the number of gates or the amount of wires. Such a cost is usually related to the overall metal occupation on the silicon wafer. Other cost criteria could well be used, the overall price or energy used by the circuit. But given the functional, operational, and financial cost, and given the ball and expression of a function, the idea is to convey that there are techniques out there to minimize the overall circuit implementation cost, and Carnot Map is one of the most popular ones. Today's topic is a bit wider than what we cover here, but we will be touching upon those more trendy, stylish topics moving forward. So we have seen in previous lecture that Boolean expressions may be simplified by algebraic means. Today's lecture is a bit more formal demonstration of that principle through effective techniques. The circuit optimization might be pretty significant because it may lead to cost savings, efficient design, and better performance. As in any optimization problem we face every day, there needs to be a cost function that quantifies somehow how simple the circuit implementation is given the used resources. We define here three cost criteria that we will focus on later. Three different cost criteria are variable literal cost, represented by a VL and L or L in capitals, gate input cost, represented by G in capitals, gate input cost with knots, GN in capitals. Variable cost is, is known as the, the literal cost and is the number of variable appearances in the Boolean expression of the logic circuit. For example, consider the following AB prime plus ABC prime plus A prime BD. The total number of variables is 8, so V is 8. The gate input cost, on the other hand, is the number of inputs to the gates in the implementation of the Boolean representation. We have the same example, but this time the circuit diagram is drawn in which we count three NOT gates, five AND, and two OR gates. If we count the number of inputs to the logic gates that are labeled with little pink circles in, the circle in this picture, we will get G equals 11. If we include the NOT gates, we have three by the way, we'll obtain GN being equal to 14. Let us consider a different function in SOP4 in this case. This function is expressed as ABC plus A prime, B prime, C prime. Here you can compute the cost values of V being 6 and G being 8 and GN equals 11. As you can see that the logic diagram that corresponds to this Boolean expression is shown on the right. If you alternatively express the same function in POS form, we get the function A plus C prime, B prime in parentheses, and end it with a B prime plus C in parentheses and A prime plus B in parentheses. It is left as an exercise to verify as an exercise to verify the equivalence of these expressions. The logic block diagram of this that corresponds to the Boolean expression is shown on the right as well. The cost criterion in this case would be V equals 6, G equals 9, and GN equals 12. Obviously, the SOP form gives us less costly implementation and therefore it might be preferable over the POS-based implementation. The real job of a designer is to identify different ways of implementing a set of Boolean functions and compare and evaluate them based on a certain criterion. We'll be focusing on the design framework in the next lecture. Let's introduce Carnot Maps. Carnot Maps are used to simplify real-world logic requirements so that they can be implemented using a minimum number of physical logical gates. They are also known as K-maps and introduced by Meyers Carnot in 1953. A K-map consists of square cell and each cell represents a particular mean term. Collection of these cells represent a Boolean function. The mean terms are placed in a very special format such that the mean terms in adjacent cells differ in the value of one single variable. The use of K-maps is a quite general subject. For example, whenever complicated Boolean con conditions are involved in a software conditional statement setting, for example, K-maps may come very, very handy. Now it is time to show how we use Carnot maps to simplify the function, for example, f equals x prime y plus xy. This simple function uh, is, is, can be used uh, like we can use classical Boolean axioms to reduce it down to to y using our classical approach. The Carnot map illustration is on the other hand is quite informative. 
once we know which call, uh, uh, what, I mean, which cell gets what min term, uh, we can place ones in those cells corresponding to each term in the SOP expression of the function f. The final kernel map corresponding to function f is shown on the bottom right. The figure right above it shows which cell gets what min term, and uh, and, and this is for your information. Later, we will avoid drawing it again and again to save some space. The rectangle drawn with a dotted red line indicates that f equals y, because the terms corresponding to x equals 0 and x equals 1 cancels out all the x terms in the function f. This is the same as writing x plus x prime equals 1. This is one of the Boolean axioms, by the way, if you remember. Consider another example where this time the function is the same as the previous one except an additional term x, y prime. Once you draw the kernel map, the same rectangle of the previous example represents the variable y and we additionally have x, y prime. So the function equals y plus, y plus x, y prime. However, we know using absorption theorem that we can further reduce it down to x plus y as shown. However, Carnot maps further allows us to obtain the final reduction by making the observation that we have overlapping sets, rectangles in our case. Um, also observe the blue rectangle right at the bottom of the map representing the variable x. And now the union of blue and the red rectangles where you of two cells cover all the ones in the Carnot map. These rectangles correspond to x and y, so the union is x plus y. So the first lesson we should take from this practice is to cover adjacent cells as much as possible. Yet here the rectangles could only be of size in powers of 2. It should be kind of intuitive now and clear that why this is so, if you think about it. Because otherwise, variable cancellations would not happen. We will develop, develop this important rule more later. Next, it is a good idea to explore three variable case. It is pretty important to cover multivariable Carnot maps to be able to see how mean terms are placed and the rules that make up a valid map. As you can see from the uh, top figure, that the index values are ordered just like gray codes, so that the binary value of the index differs in only one bit position for all the adjacent cells. We can also identify the sets of rectangles that shall correspond to literals x, y, and z. These regions are shown in the bottom figure. Please study and convince yourself that there are indeed the right rectangles. Carnot maps should be taught as a three-dimensional object called torus rather than a 2D table. When making these groupings to find out the right set of rectangles, well, just we have done in the previous slide. Torus is a surface of a revolution generated by revolving a circuit in three-dimensional space about an axis coplanar with the circle. Similar to previous example, here I show the complements of the literals x, y, and z. The complements of x and y are easy to see in two-dimensional plane. To be able to see z prime, or inverse of z, we need to think of the map as a three-dimensional torus. In that case, mean term cells m sub 0, m sub 4, become adjacent to m sub 2 and m sub 6. I know it's a bit hard to visualize the adjacency, but through practice you will overcome this difficulty pretty decently. It must be obvious by now that the three variable case we needed four cells to simplify a signal, a single uh, literal. In general, for n variables, we should have needed two to the n minus one cells. Okay, now we think about four variable case. From previous discussion, for n equals four, we need we needed eight cells to simplify to a single literal. Here are the rectangles that represent literals x, y, z, and t. It is left as an exercise to locate the literal complements. complements. Let us go over more examples for four variables. The function under consideration is expressed as the sum of mean terms 0, 2, 6, 7, 8, 10, 14, and 15. They are located in designated cells in the Carnot map representation as shown. Note here that since the K map has a torus shape in 3D, therefore X not, Y not, Z not, T not, X, Y not, Z not, T not, and X, Y not, Z, T not, and finally X, Y not, Z, T not, they are all adjacent. 
If you remember the previous KMAP illustration, you should be able to realize that the coronal cells simplify to Y prime T prime or Y naught T naught because it is the intersection of sets Y prime and T prime. Using the same reasoning, it is easy to see the rest of the cells with a logical one value that simplifies to YZ. Let us derive more rules from all the KMAP illustrations we are experienced with. A close inspection of KMAP reveals that um, KMAP cells with value 1 can be grouped into a rectangle with the number of cells being equal to a power of 2. These rectangles are known as prime implicants. After finding all the prime implicants, we can determine the ones that are the only prime implicants that cover one or more mean terms. These prime implicants have a special name, and they are called essential prime implicants. So let us go into an exercise here, and we find all prime implicants. Note that there is no prime implicant that contains eight cells in this example. So we start with finding four cell prime implicants and expect them to cover all the ones in the Carnot map. If you fail to do so, you continue with finding two cell prime implicants and move on. That, that will cover the remaining ones in the map. So here, for example, a prime implicant that contains four cells is shown, that we already covered that. The second one is another prime implicant with four cells. The third one is another prime implicant with four cells. And now, we are now actually, um, here, we cannot cover the remaining one using a four cell prime implicant, so we use one of the two cell prime implicants, and that's shown in the next slide. So we stop once we cover all the ones in the map. This means that we have got, we found five prime implicants in total, and this is the blue one is the last one. If you observe the map carefully, we can realize that there are three essential prime implicants that are shown in red. So here is the pre procedure for optimization algorithm. Find all prime implicants that we have done so far for that exercise. We set the solution set to zero, that's an empty set. Put all the essential prime implicants into the solution set. Put a minimum cost set of non-essential prime implicants that covers all the mean terms that yet covered that not not yet covered by the essential prime implicants. So going back to our previous example, we already spotted the essential prime implicants and we included them in our set. Additionally, we have selected the designated prime implicants as selected and included in our solution set. That is in blue. We have shown. I mean, we could have chosen the other prime implicant, that is in gray, um, but that would give us the expression y prime z prime in terms of the number of literals, that would not be any significant difference, but for other criteria, there might be such, uh, such as y prime z prime has, uh, has to use one more not gate compared to z prime t. So there might be some differences between selecting two different prime implicants and, uh, and include them in our set solution set. It is therefore important to think about such optimal selections based on the cost criterion we use. So the fi final uh, function uh, that minimizes the cost is shown by G, which is Y prime T prime plus Z prime T plus Y T plus X Z T prime. In a Carnot map representation of a function, there could be cases which would not matter from a design perspective. For example, if the input values for the mean term does not occur, or the output value for the mean term is not used by any means. In that case, the output values are not important and shall be labeled as don't care, solely because it will give us the flexibility and the design freedom, which I will show in a bit. Here the don't cares are shown as X or cross sign in the Carnot map, and the flexibility of assuming don't cares instead of logical zero and or one as needed can reduce the cost of the logic circuit dramatically. Let us go through the example. Here we use an alternative sum term in the original Bolden expression where the second sum signifies the mean terms that do not matter with regard to the functional operation. We can assume x or cross sign to be either 0 or y, 1 while we optimize the implementation through finding prime implicants. Here is how. The picture shows an optimized solution. In this case, the number of literals or variables is 6. Number of gate inputs is given by 9, and gate inputs with nots amounts to 11. Let's consider the same example, but this time the inverse of the function. 
the Carnot map of the inverse of f has ones in places of zeros of the previous map, if you realize that the, the don't cares stay in, intact, by the way. So if we use the optimization techniques, we can come up with the expression x prime z prime plus x prime y and y prime t. Of course, we need to invert this to get the original function f. This will give us a Boolean expression in terms of POS form. So what's interesting about this expression is that the cost of the circuit implementation is less with the POS form or product of sums form of the same Boolean expression. So it is left as an exercise to show that. So I want to finally touch upon one of the interesting research problems that's most current to our subject matter. So far, we have covered a simplification or optimization procedure that helps reduce the number of literals in a given Boolean function through, say, Carlo maps or at other methods which we haven't covered here today. But I highly encourage you guys to go and search for other interesting methods out there. This is usually called two-level optimization. So we covered today a two-level optimization procedure. What if we are given to implement a set of Boolean uh, functions using the same set of inputs on the same physical silicon wafer area? In other words, independently minimizing each Boolean function does not necessarily give us a global optimum solution. When we think of all of the Boolean functions being implemented using the same resources, that's a resource share problem. This problem is known as multi-level optimization and it might be easy to perform for simple circuits. However, it may become very hard problem for more and more bigger, bigger and bigger circuits. Therefore, a neat methodology is needed to accomplish decent optimization of multiple Boolean functions. There are some past research uh, attempted to address this issue. I totally encourage you to go and search this matter, as, as this might be well uh, be an end-term project, for example. And I'm, and, and I'm always open to, to have discussions on this topic. So in summary, we covered various aspects of circuit, minim uh, circuit minimization based on an optimization criterion. We've covered a nice machinery called Carnot maps to alternatively represent the combinational circuit behavior. Um, so after establishing necessary background and reviewing the available tools in the next lecture, hopefully we will be focusing on the design of combinational logic circuits. Please feel free to drop any questions you might have about today's lecture into my email box. And I'll be more than happy to respond to your questions. Thank you.